So this lecture actually is uh, a bit of a digression and it is supposed to cover some of the basics that we will need uh, for various sections of the course. So it is very important that you understand some concepts from linear algebra, uh, specifically eigenvalues, eigenvectors uh, and in particular today we will do principal component analysis and the reason that I do it is there is a very neat uh, relation of PCA uh, to autoencoders and autoencoders is something that we will cover in the course. It's a part of any deep neural networks course and singular value decomposition is something that we will be using when we learn word vectors. Now word vector is again something very important. I can just I can do the non SVD version of it where I just talk about what word to vec is but that will not give you the same uh, 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 probably not the same interpretation as if you start from SVD and then reach word vectors right. So that is why I am covering these basics. So how many of you know eigenvalues and eigenvectors? very embarrassing question ok. How many of you absolutely hate eigenvalues and eigenvectors? So let us see if we can change that today ok. I mean on the positive side right uh, ok. Uh, so what happens uh, when a matrix hits a vector? So most of you a lot of people that I talk to right actually think that eigenvectors are the villains of linear algebra. It is very hard to understand them and so on. But today I am going to make a case for they are not the villains, they are actually the superheroes of linear algebra. So that is what the lecture is about, ok. So what happens when a matrix hits a vector? Transforms it, right. So actually what happens is that it strays from its path, right. So this is the original, uh, ok, that's what is, this is the original vector x, ok. And now once I multiply it by a x, that means if I do the transformation a x, then I get a new vector and two things happen right. One is the direction changes which is obvious and in many cases the scale also changes. That means the vector might get elongated, its magnitude would increase or it would decrease right. So if you really think about it actually right, so matrices are the real villains of linear algebra right. I mean just look at this vector, it was minding its own business going along its own direction. A matrix comes and hits it and completely changes its world right. I mean it just throws it off path increases the dimension or slows it down or whatever right. So that is they are the bad guys. Now for every villain what do you have? A superhero right. So what is the superhero corresponding to a vector? What does a superhero do? No, no that is a very <laughs> linear algebraic, I am talking about comic books right. This is a very linear algebraic answer. It stands up to the villain right ok. And that is exactly what eigenvectors do right. They refuse to change their path. They tell the matrix ok you can hit me as many times as you want, probably you can increase my uh, you could probably slow me down a bit or push me ahead or something but I am not going to stray off from a path right. So that is what eigen eigenvectors do. So here is a matrix which is a villain and here is an eigenvector which is our hero and now when this matrix hits this eigenvector it refuses to stray from its path right. It says ok I will move forward, I will move back whatever but I will not change my direction ok I will just stay honest to what I am and these vectors are called the eigenvectors. And more formally, you can write it as Ax is equal to lambda x, right. So that means the direction remains the same, only the scale changes. It will either get slowed down or it will uh, get boosted up, right. So the magnitude would change, but the direction remains the same, right, okay. Now, uh, what is so special about eigenvectors? Like, why are, why is it that they are always in the line, right? I know that any course that you do, invariably you touch eigenvectors or eigenvalues at some point in that course, right whether be it machine learning, image processing, whatever you do, you will always speech, everything that you do, you will always have eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Why is it so? Because it turns out that several properties of matrices can actually be explained away by looking at their eigenvalues, right. So if I look at a matrix, I would probably not be able to comment much on it. But if you tell me something about the eigenvalues, I can see a lot of things about them. And there is an entire field on this, right, this entire spectral graph theory, which looks at properties of Laplacian matrices and come in something on the properties of the graph and so on, right. And that is just an example which we do not care about. But what we care about in this course, there are a few things that we care about with respect to eigenvalues and eigenvectors and that is what I am going to focus on, right. So that is what this lecture is going to be about. And I will take two specific cases which are very important for us to understand certain concepts later on. So I will start with the first one and I will start with a very uh, simple example to motivate this problem 
and eventually will lead to a result which will help us understand a very important concept in uh, deep neural network training which is exploding and vanishing, vanishing gradients. We will not touch that concept today but we will use these ideas when we are looking at that later on. Okay. So let us take this example of two restaurants. So there is a Chinese restaurant and a Mexican restaurant and on day one K1 students eat in the Chinese restaurant and K2 students eat in the Mexican restaurant. Okay. So this is what my situation is on day 0. K1 for Chinese and K2 for Mexican. Okay. Now what happens as is obvious people get bored or they have different want to try out different things. So on day 2 or rather each subsequent day what happens is that a fraction P of the students who ate Chinese today will opt for Max Mexican uh, on, day, on the next day and a fraction Q of the students who ate Ma Mexican today are going to opt for Chinese. So you get this situation. right? So I started with K1, K2. So what I am saying is on day 1 that is the next day only a fraction P of the K1 students will remain for Chinese and a fraction 1 minus Q would be transferred from Mexican to Chinese. Okay? And similarly only a fraction Q of the students would again stick to the Mexican food and a fraction 1 minus P into K1 would shift from Chinese to Mexican. Is the setup clear? Okay? Can you write this as a matrix operation? It would be a matrix multiplied by a vector. Right? Can you tell me the vector? K1, K2 and the matrix is then obvious. Okay? This is what it is. And I am saying that this happens on each subsequent day. Right? So every day now this keeps happening. So on day 1 I started with say 180 and now day 2 it changed to something. Again day 3 it will change something by the same fraction. Okay? Now let me call this as matrix M and this is of course v0 right by definition as we decided now what would happen on day 2 what would v2 be m applied to v1 right and which would be m square applied to v0 i'm just substituting the value of v1 which is m into v0 in general on the nth day what would happen m raised to n into v0 okay so you see that the number of customers in the two restaurants is given by this series you had v0 then m into v0, then m square v0 and so on up to m raised to n vn. Okay? You see how the number of uh, customers is changing. Now, and this is how I represent it as a state transition diagram. Right? So I had certain numbers on day 1 and it changed with a, trans with a probability p they will stay back. With a probability 1 minus p they will move to the next or the different restaurant and so on. Right? And now this though a very toyish example. Can you relate it to many things in real life or many things that you will take in decision making, right? That you are, so even if you are playing a game for example, right? Even if you are playing Atari games or something, you are in a certain state based on some action that you will take, you will move to a different state and so on, right? So these things happen in various real world applications, right? There is a certain state, for example, even in stock market prediction, you are at a certain uh, value of a stock, it might change to a different value, right? And these values you could just say them as high, low or neutral, right? I am not going into the actual numbers. Today the stock value is high, there is a possibility that it will transition to something low and so on. Right? So these, uh, these kind of straight transition diagrams occur in various real world examples. Okay? Now this is a problem for the two restaurant owners. right? Why is this a problem for the two restaurant owners? They don't know how much food to make because every day the number of customers is changing. Right? But is the number of customers actually changing? Will the system eventually reach a steady state? Will it, is it obvious that it will reach a steady state or maybe it will not even reach a steady state. The way I described it, I don't see why it should reach a steady state. Right? You have some people here, they go there, come back, go there and so on. The only thing which I have assumed is that the transition matrix, which was the matrix M, is constant across all the time steps. Right? So every day it's at the same probabilities by which things are changed. Right? So what is your guess? If I were to ask you to take a guess, okay, let's see how many of you think. and it's uh, there is no correct answer here at this point. So just tell me how many of you think it will reach a steady state? How many of you think it will keep changing? And why is the sum never equal to 1? Okay. So fine. So it turns out that they will, right? And let's see how. So we'll define some things and some of these are just definitions. Some of them have accompanying proofs which I am not going to do here. You can, the proofs have been linked from the slides. So you can take a look at them if you are interested. Right? 
So suppose there's a matrix A, uh, n cross n matrix, which has eigenvalues uh, uh, lambda 1, lambda 2 up to lambda n. Now what this definition is saying is that, assume that there's one eigenvalue which is greater, there's no assumption actually, the eigenvalue which is greater than all the other eigenvalues is called the dominant eigenvalue. And when I'm looking at the dominant eigenvalue, I'm only considering the magnitude, not the sign. Okay, so it could be that an eigenvalue is minus 10 and all the other eigenvalues are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the dominant eigenvalue would be minus 10, right? And I'll just take it as 10. Is that clear? The definition of a dominant eigenvalue? Okay. Now, how many of you know what is a stochastic matrix? Uh, so matrix M is called a stochastic matrix. If all the entries are positive and the sum of the elements in each column is equal to 1. So now this definition is again slightly misstated. So there is a row stochastic matrix, a column stochastic matrix, and also a doubly stochastic matrix, right? So what I'm talking about here is a column stochastic matrix, like our matrix. Have you seen such a stochastic matrix any time in your life in the last five minutes? The M matrix, okay, right? So the M matrix is a stochastic matrix because the sum of the columns was one, right? You had P1 minus P, Q1 minus Q, okay? Or was it the sum of the rows was one? Rows was one, is it? The columns was one. Okay, fine. Fine. So this is a stochastic matrix, just a definition. Now I'll combine these two definitions, which is dominant eigenvalue and stochastic matrix, and give you a theorem. Right. So the largest dominant or the dominant eigenvalue of a stochastic matrix is equal to one. Okay. So to prove this, what do I have to prove? So I need to prove two things. One that 1 is an eigenvalue of this matrix, of any stochastic matrix, and second, all the other eigenvalues are less than 1. So that's exactly what this proof does here. You can take a look at it. And just uh, to give you a heads up, so last year I used to do this, that please see the proof, go back and look at the proof. People never looked at the proofs, so I used to ask them in the quiz, because I used to be sure that people not do it to answer them, right? So please, when I say go back and look at the proof, do, do, do that, okay? So, and lastly, if A is an n cross n square matrix and you have this series A v0, A square v0 up to A n v n, then this series will converge to the dominant eigenvector of A. What does the statement mean? Let us not get into the proof, right? What does it actually mean? Okay, so let us start with very basic stuff, right? What is this series actually? What is each element in this series? It is a vector. Everyone gets that? Every element in this series is a vector. Now, what do I mean that a series of vectors converges to the dominant eigenvector? What does convergence mean? If I keep finding the next element, next element, next element of this series, okay, and I keep doing this as long as I can, I will reach a value n, right, where n is the nth element in the series, which will just be a multiple of the dominant eigenvector. Is that clear? You not seem to be clear. Okay. Everyone gets that? Okay, so what do you mean by if you take a series of numbers and if I say that the series converges to 0, what does that mean? If you keep finding the next element in the series, you will hit a point n where you find the nth element of the series and it will be 0. And not only that, that uh, okay, so we will just, I will leave it at that for now. Now, uh, so stochastic matrix, dominant eigenvalues, the connection between two and the convergence theorem for a series of uh, vectors which is uh, a v0, a square v0 and so on. Okay, now let ED be the dominant eigenvector of M, where M is a dash matrix. In our case, it's a stochastic matrix. So, what would the corresponding dominant eigenvalue be? One. Okay. So, given the previous definitions and theorems, what can you say about the sequence? It converges to a dash of ED, a multiple of ED, right? So, there exists an N such that the nth nth element of the series, which is given by this, is going to be equal to a sum multiple of the dominant eigen vector. No, no, no. K is sum multiple. No, no. This is not related to eigen values yet. Okay, just wait for the next statement. Then you will see the difference that this is not the eigen value yet. Okay. Uh, now my question is, what happens from here onwards? What would be the next element in the series? How many of you say sum k dash into ed? What's the other? I don't have the other option. What's the other option actually? K into ED. How many of you say K into ED? A large number of you. Okay. So you see that now. Just notice the eigenvalue will come up, right? So at step n plus one, you would have m into Vn, which is m into K into ED, and this quantity is actually one. 
So the theorem says it will converge to some multiple of k. And now if it's a stochastic matrix, what will happen after that time step? It will just remain the same vector. So what would happen to the number of customers in the two restaurants? It will remain the same. Right? You get that? Okay? Fine. Now this was all for what kind of matrices? Square stochastic matrices. Okay? But we generally care about any square matrix. In fact, we should care about any matrix, not discriminate, but any square matrix will do for now. Okay? Uh, so for a square matrix, let P be the time step at which the series approaches a multiple of the dominant eigenvector. The theorem was for any square matrix. Remember, it was not for stochastic square matrices. We just use this value that for a stochastic square matrix, the dominant eigenvalue is 1, which, need, which leads to that neat result that the, num, the, the, the number of customers just becomes constant. Right? Okay, but for any square matrix, I could write it as this, that there exists some step P at which the element of the pth element of the series would just be a multiple of the dominant eigenvector. Okay? Now what would happen at step P plus 1? Is this fine? Okay. What about step P plus 2? And in general at P plus k or P plus n? Everyone gets this? Okay. So now, can you tell me what does this, knowing this dominant eigenvalue, tell us about this series? When will it stabilize actually? When lambda is equal to 1, that is the case we already saw. If the dominant eigenvalue is greater than 1, what would happen? The series will explode. And if it is less than 1, what would happen? The series will vanish. Okay. So this is an important result that we will use when we are discussing exploding and vanishing gradients. So we will see that in the case of something known as recurrent neural networks, you end up with something of this sort. and then I'll make some comments on that. Right? So that's where we'll be using this. This will come probably six, seven, or maybe even more lectures down the line. Okay, but we'll be using it at this point. So the main result from here is that if the dominant eigenvalue, this should be lambda d, is greater than one, then it will explode. Less than one, it will vanish, and equal to one, it will stabilize. Okay, is that fine? Okay. So that's one result, one important property of eigenvalues and eigenvectors that we'll be needing at a later point in the course.